Representative Ledger Fernandez, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. I love coming <laughs> here and I love this show, so thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I wanted to start with infrastructure. In your campaign, and since you've taken office, you've had the joy of driving around your gigantic district, um, but you know the importance of, of declining infrastructure. Um, certainly the roads that you drive on, the bridges that you go over and under, um, also broadband, you know, as you visit some of these far-flung communities. Um, how do you feel about what's in, to the extent that you've seen it, um, the infrastructure bill that the Senate will be considering here in short order? We have to address infrastructure with a really bold, bold plan. And that's what we are working on in the House, and that's what we are going to work on when we look at the totality of the infrastructure package. So what the Senate is working on right now is going to be one aspect of how we address infrastructure. Let me talk about what we did in the House. So in the House, we passed the Invest in America Act. The Invest in America Act was significant in that it included a lot of very important climate change issues so that we could have more electric uh, uh, electric charging stations so we could address the moment that we're in with the necessary funding that we need. And indeed in that, in the, the Invest in America package, I secured $20 million for this broad district, which included fixing the bridges so that the Navajo children can ride a school bus to school. Because right now they can't. Uh, so the Superman bridges are going to be fixed. Uh, so that's the kind of thing we need to do is sort of address all those very small things, like fixing the bridges so the children can get to school, to the larger issues of we must start looking at our infrastructure as an opportunity for both needing the needs we have in this moment as well as the bigger moment. That's what we are looking at in the House. The Senate uh, bipartisan plan has many elements of those, but not all of them. So what we're going to do is take those, take a good look at it. I've been giving feedback to our senators. We have been giving feedback to the Senate with some of the bills that we've uh, introduced and passed, like broadband. Big broadband uh, fan of getting more of it into the ground. And so we have a broadband bill, and many of those aspects of that bill are being incorporated into that Senate bipartisan package. But to the extent that it doesn't go far enough, what we're going to do is look at the reconciliation process and include what we need in the reconciliation package. So we need Americans and New Mexicans to realize that this isn't it because it's not big enough. Um, you mentioned that package. It's extremely sizable, um, a huge $3.5 trillion as it's being talked about now. Um, and it would include that broader um, sort of definition of infrastructure, things like childcare, healthcare, that sort of thing. Um, it's hard to imagine that you can pay for that without raising taxes. I think the question is probably on who. Um, as you look at funding something that size, how do you favor doing that? Well, I am in favor of the plan that we've been discussing, which is where no one who earns less than 400000 that's earns less than 400000 a year, would see any increase. And so what you'd see is New Mexicans, the vast majority of New Mexicans would not see any increase. In fact, they would see a decrease in their taxes because we're going to make sure that we make permanent the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit. Those benefit the working families, the middle class families of New Mexico. So, but for those who are billionaires, for those corporations who earn billions and don't pay a dime in taxes, they will see fair taxation. So, you know, everybody must pay their fair share. And we're going to make sure that corporations can't avoid paying taxes because let's face it, big corporations like Amazon, they, uh, they enjoy the benefits of what our American government provides. Uh, billionaires saw their income skyrocket during the pandemic. We need to have them pay their fair share. So that's how we're going to pay for that. Uh, the president has said that he's willing to use that reconciliation process also to address immigration, um, specifically DACA and um, dealing with the Dreamers as well. Um, immigration isn't typically thought of something that's a budget-related um, uh, issue necessarily. How do you feel about that approach? 
It is absolutely the right approach. Listen, I worked uh, on the Immigration Reform and Control Act back uh, in my early days when I was still actually a law student. We did some amazing work around that. Uh, and that was a $1.4 trillion benefit to the economy. We are seeing the same thing when we look at doing immigration reform. It's about the same, a $1.3 trillion benefit to our economy, $700 a year increase in everybody's wages. We would add six years to the solvency of Social Security. So to look at immigration as an economic benefit and that it should be included in a reconciliation bill, which is looking at budget, is the right thing to do. So we know that immigration makes sense from an economic standpoint. Then you have to ask, well, then why do people oppose it? And it shouldn't be opposed on an economic stance. It shouldn't be opposed on a humanitarian stance. I have been to the border. I have seen the children who the parents have sent to safety. And I need to tell you, it reminded me, it reminded me of a story that is old as the Bible itself. Moses' mother placed her baby in a basket and sent him down the Nile to get him to safety. We are looking at parents and at families that are fleeing violence and that are fearful for our li their lives, and we must provide them with the asylum and the refuge that our laws provide. And if we don't politicize the issue, then we'd be able to just do that as a matter of course. If we didn't politicize the issue, then we would see the economic benefits of immigration and be able to pass it in regular order. But because we are not getting that support, um, even among Republicans who want it or are afraid to come out in favor of it, we'll have to do it through reconciliation. But it works because it's an economic benefit to the nation. Should the path to citizenship um, include preferred status for people who are already here? Um, and if so, uh, wouldn't the news that that is going to happen create a further rush to the border for people who want to get across before that law passes? So the, the way the American Citizenship Act is, uh, is set up, it would not, uh, would not create that rush to the border because it does have a deadline as to when you would be able to apply. And looking at the DACA, the, you know, our wonderful dreamers who are, you know, our doctors, our future doctors and Congress people, Raul Ruiz, Dr. Raul Ruiz was brought here as a child undocumented. He was a dreamer of the past and he is now the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. So what we're doing is those people who've already been here, who were brought here as children, who have been working here, who've been providing the essential services for us, they're the ones that we are talking about. It's about 11 million people right now. Okay, okay. Um, ranch owners, county governments down south along the border, um, they're extremely worried about um, increased um, illegal border crossings. Uh, how would the plan, as you understand it, address some of those concerns about safety, both for the migrants and for the people who live on or near the border? Well, if we had an, uh, an immigration system that was working, then there would be a, a manner and a way for immigrants to present themselves and to go through an immigration system. We don't have that right now. Let's think of Ellis Island, right? There used to be a way where you wanted to come to the United States and you would be able to do it. Now that was when you were coming from Europe. Why don't we have the same thing when you're coming from the Americas, right? Uh, so we need to set that up so that there is a system and a process for presenting yourself um, for immigration, for asylum cases at the border. And if we did that, that would relieve some of the pressure of people trying to cross in very dangerous situations, uh, you know, in the desert, in places where there is not enough water, trying to scale a wall and, and dropping down. So what we need to do is create an immigration system where you can actually present and seek uh, the immigration status that you want at the border. Um, I do want to talk about COVID, but uh, I also don't want to let this pass. You said that you asked the question, why don't we have um, a system like Ellis Island for immigration from the Americas? Do you have an answer for that? Well, I think it's because it has been politicized and they have uh, sought to demonize another uh, in order to get political gain. And they have sought to demonize Mexicans and Latinos. It's about bigotry. It's about racism. Okay. 
Um, the FDA right now, uh, as we speak, um, they're trying to balance this idea of solid science and uh, give the at least the perception that, look, this process wasn't rushed. Um, but they're also getting lots of pressure from employers, from the federal government, state governments, uh, institutions like University of New Mexico, where we are now, um, to get that approval, that full approval of vaccines, specifically the mRNA ones. Um, how do you feel about the timing of that process and the effort um, to let people know, like, hey, we're not doing this just off the cuff. This, right. is, this is being studied. So I think it's important to remember that right now we have had millions of people vaccinated, both in the United States and around the world. Um, look at what's happening in Britain and Israel and uh, the EU countries. And so we have actually a lot of data that this works. Uh, it is right now a, um, uh, not a full approval, but it is an approval that is demonstrating to the world that vaccination works that it's safe and that this is how we protect our community. This is how we protect those children who can't get vaccinated. This is how we protect immunocompromised people that might not be, get, be able to get vaccinated. So rather than trying to s lay your hat on different reasons why you, you don't want to get vaccinated, set that aside and think about the public health and think about your communities. The vaccination works. I got vaccinated back in January because I fly back and forth in a continuation of government, right? We needed every vote to be able to, you know, pass our bills and do our job. I'm fine. Millions of people are fine. Don't seek reasons why not to do it. Think about why you might want to do it. And we need to remember that vaccines have been saving lives for it's more than a century, right? We've had a long time of vaccines saving our lives from smallpox to, you know, chickenpox. Like there is a range of things that we use the vaccines for that we have our children get vaccines. Every year I used to go get my kids vaccinated because otherwise I can't enroll them in school. This is very similar. We're trying to save lives and we're trying to keep the community safe. And so I encourage everybody to get a vaccine as soon as possible. Do it for yourself, do it for those children, do it for your neighbors. When you walked in, um, we all had masks on. Um, we're distanced now. Um, we've returned to masking while at work, except in some rare circumstances. Uh, do you foresee the need for more mask mandates, so to speak, or? Are the people who are wearing va masks now um, the people who are going to be wearing masks regardless? Uh, I think mask mandates make sense uh, if science calls for them. And the fact that we have so many unvaccinated people who uh, might be going to D.C., right? D.C. has low, uh, low transmission rates, but we also receive people from across the country. And so they're coming from places where they have very low vaccination rates. Um, so wearing the masks helps everybody and we need to remember is if we all wear the masks and we all get vaccinated we'll get through this faster so rather than fighting it help us get through it faster get vaccinated wear the mask until we get out of this that way we get through it faster you know i heard a interview with somebody who had a business today and it resonated where he said i'm going to do the mask mandate, I'm gonna follow it because this is how I make sure my business doesn't get closed again. If we want our businesses to stay open, if we want our schools to stay open, if we want our community to be vibrant and lively, then we do everything we can to move past this pandemic. And that includes masks, and that includes vaccinations, and that includes testing. Uh, I'm doing regular tests now because I think it's important for me to know um, Am I going to be putting anybody at risk, despite the fact that I'm double vaccinated, right? I think we all do whatever we can to help protect each other. Congresswoman, thanks so much for your time. Thank you.